Can I sit? Or, uh, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, Rob. All right. I, I don't have to stand any particular place, do I? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, Sean asked me last year to if I would do this, and, uh, and hey, I thought that was great because telling stories is always fun. It's not a formal lecture or anything. Uh, so, um, anyway, uh, I kind of don't like that title, Early Days. That makes me feel old, um, but oh well. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, I first came out in 1968, and I left in 1989. It was, what, 21 years. Uh, originally, the place was called Santa Catalina Marine Biological Laboratory. I know it's changed names a couple times, but that's what the original name was. And it was under the biology department in Hancock. Um, I don't know what it's under now. Um, at that time, Bud Abbott was chairman of biology, and he, uh, the plate, there was nobody out here except Bob Given and Dennis Lee. And so Abbott was going around the university trying to solicit people to come out here and do things. And uh, <clears throat> one of the people they contacted was Pat Meehan, who was chairman of the bio uh, physiology department at the medical school, where I was a uh, uh, at that time, a, a PhD graduate student. And uh, so we came out uh, to see the place. Um, now, to, to finish the list there, the first director here was Russ Zimmer, and Bob Given was here from the very beginning, and he was the assistant director. And then when Zimmer left, Bob became the director, and then finally Ann Muscat was the director up to the time that, when I left anyway. And the other person originally that was involved was uh, Vic Tibby, who was the head of the Oceanographic Associates, who uh, a bunch of uh, major corporations and rich people who donated to, to build a lot of the main parts of this place. Um, and those are the people that I uh, knew and dealt with. Um, after I left there, of course, there were many changes. Um, this is the 1968, and um, you can see that the building is there, the dive locker is there, a small pier and dock. The hangar was not there, but the ramp was, and then the uh, the uh, sewer system and the uh, saltwater intake were in. That was that was all that was there. There was no housing or anything. <laughs> um, so uh, that's that's when it started. And at this point, uh, uh, Bob Given and a guy named Dennis Lees were the only ones out. Dennis left. Both of Bob and Dennis had worked for the California Fish and Game, and Dennis went back to the Fish and Game. Bob stayed here. Bob was in Avalon and drove every day uh, for years and years and years and years. I don't know how many vans he burned up, but uh, he turned one over too. Um, in any event, that's what the place looked like at that time. And transportation <laughs> was a big deal. This is the building when, at that time. There wasn't much else there. The building is pretty much the same. Um, this is what we came over in with a spa. And uh, I asked Gordy what, what happened to this bar. He didn't know. I don't. I had no idea what happened to it. But it was the primary transport boat for many, many years. Yeah, well, well, it was. <laughs> um, it was not a comfortable boat, I wouldn't say. But uh, you can see the size of the dock. It couldn't handle much more than that. So uh, you know. Oh, by the way, that dinghy there. I, I walked up to the. Uh, boneyard, and it's still there. I was amazed. <laughs> so, uh, that used to be our, our dock boat to row out to wherever we were going. And uh, the other uh, boat was Golden West. It 
had a strange way of talking. <laughs> I was off that day. <laughs> um, the, the throttle stuff. At least that's what he said. But anyway, that ran for a long time. Um, I'm sure some of you know. Uh, actually, in the beginning, we used Boston Whalers more than anything else. Um, uh, this was uh, the Beaver, which Bob Gibbard used for many years, the dive boat and what have you. And that's my boat over there. I made about three or four hundred trips across the channel in that boat. It, uh, it was uh, uh, honestly, it was always this smooth. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the other thing I'll mention is um, that boat down there, which I'm sure is long gone, if you can barely read it, it says Dog One. And that was the real workhorse here for many, many years, the dog. One day I was going across and I see this periscope. I said, I go up to it and he was looking the other way, so I kind of tapped on it. <laughs> and it spun around and I was, it was right here and I was looking right into the periscope. <laughs> and I always wonder what those guys are down there. <laughs> 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 Another time, um, I had a problem. I, I hit a blue shark, and uh, the blue shark won. Um, I had to hitchhike back to Redondo. Um, that was a costly uh, run. Uh, the other way we traveled was the Grand Goose, and I love that airplane. I just enjoyed it. It landed at Cat Harbor and come up on the ramp. Um, I like that. It uh, was really great. I thought the, they uh, crashed a few times and uh, uh, I'm having trouble. There we go. It would, it would land and take off at uh, Phoenix. Yeah, uh, at uh, Cat Harbor. And uh, Sometimes when the tide was low, they landed on the isthmus side, and you had to take a, a skiff out to load. And uh, one time they beached it there, and you had to wade in up to your waist to get into the air. Um, it was a different way of traveling. And sometimes it didn't work too well. Uh, Bob Griffin was on board when this one crashed at Cat Harbor. Um, it, nobody was hurt, but uh, it sure got their attention. You can see the bow got crushed. Look at the, the propellers on this side. <laughs> anyway, um, they, uh, they had a, uh, they used to be under the Vincent Thomas Bridge, and one day a guy jumped off the bridge and landed on the wing of one of these planes. And so they had to repair that plane. And when they repaired it, they sent it back, and the FAA had to come in and inspect it. And they shut down the whole fleet because they found that there were only two bolts holding the wing on. <laughs> and, uh, so that was the end of the the Grumman sea, <laughs> the Grumman gooses. And uh, then they went to helicopters after that, uh, which were awful. And then ultimately the Express started. The Express came fairly late. It, it, we didn't have the Express in, in those days at all. There were no boats, really. Okay, this is now uh, like 69, 1969. You can see the hangars there. And uh, what we call the Lyman House, because Larry Lyman lived there. At that time, there were three employees, Bob Gibbon, Larry Loper, and I noticed Loper boat is still out there. He rebuilt that. Larry was the mechanic. And then Larry Langan, who lived in that house, Larry's was, Larry was in charge of the maintenance of the facility. And that was all the employees that were um, at that time. Um, you can see there's still no housing or anything up, up above. Um, that uh, vessel down there is interesting. The, the Navy came uh, uh, quite a few times. Um, this one was from uh, San Diego, the Naval Underseas Warfare Center. And 
you see the round tube in the center? Well, if you climb down the ladder to the bottom, there's a acrylic bubble that you can sit in. And uh, it looks like that. And uh, they would cruise along uh, a school of dolphins. And the whole purpose of this thing was to observe dolphin behavior underwater while going along with them. And it was really cool to ride around with that thing. Um, they had a, that out here for years. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how successful they were. Yeah. Then one day, uh, Jacques Cousteau and the Calypso came in. And uh, they uh, were only going to stay for a, a night or something. They ended up staying six months. The reason was that the squid was spawning, and they took squid into their intakes and heated up the engines. And so the divers went in, and they started yanking squid out of the intakes. And they said, huh, well, let's make a special on squid. So actually made. Uh, he had a TV series going at that time, and they actually made one on, on squid. Um, and then they they put uh, two guys uh, lived over the Christmas and filmed every day for almost six months. And the Calypso would come and go. Um, and these two guys made, I don't know how many uh, uh, rolls of film, but how many of them actually made TV, I don't know. Uh, but but they did a lot of filming. And one of the things they did is those mini subs you see on the stern there, they did a lot of exploring out in this area in those subs. And one of the things they found was a wreck uh, outside Bird Rock in 185 feet that was that went on the on Bird Rock in about 1920 something. It was a private yacht about 90 feet or so as a schooner, and it sunk. Off Bird Rock, and uh, that it was actually written up many many years ago. And uh, oh, there's shot. I gave him a ride in my boat once. <laughs> anyway, um, I noticed there's an anchor down by the volleyball court. You know what I mean? Well, this that's the anchor that was on that wreck. Oh, wow. And Cousteau brought it up not brought it to the surface, they took it over to what we call Habitat Reef, and that's where this picture was taken, and it sat there for years. We, we used it for all kinds of things, and then somebody brought it up. I don't know who brought it up and brought it ashore. But, uh, uh, also, uh, Tony Chestnut made a dive on that wreck. It's kind of a deep dive, but um, Tony shot the wind card. I, I got the, ice, the treasure chest, um, brought it up, really exciting, you know, got it on the boat deck and everything, and opened the treasure chest. Wow, you know, this is real. Tony was over there messing with his fish. Um, <laughs> and uh, opened it up, and it was lead pipe and a Coors can. <laughs> Christo put this down as a movie prop on that. <laughs> For you know, a few minutes, it was very exciting. <laughs> anyway, then Cousteau decided to hold the first international conference on deep submersibles, and he talked. Uh, he talked all these companies into coming out, and they dove that whole area between Isthmus Reef and and Bird Rock. And of course, we had the Beaver here at that time, North American Aviation. Um, uh, launching every day and t doing their testing. That's what the hangar was built for, it was built by North American Aviation. Um, and so the Beaver was already here. And then uh, there was, this was from the University of Hawaii, I forget the name of it. And there was General Dynamics. Um, the Alvin was here. Um, I don't know which one that was. In any event, there's another one over there. Every submersible in, practically in this hemisphere was here. And uh, they did their thing out there for a whole week. Uh, it's a, that was a lot of expense, a lot of uh, operation time. 
Um, and of course, Bob Gibbon had his submersible at the Oscar. <laughs> um, and he did launch it, believe it or not. Uh, it went to 10 feet and then came up. <laughs> and that was it. What happened to the Oscar? Anybody know? No. It's around the. It was here when I left. Somewhere. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. No, I scrutinized the bone there. Okay, the, then going back to the, my original trip out here, uh, I was doing my dissertation on uh, people on the main campus on uh, diving reflex, the cardiovascular uh, dynamics of diving reflex. And another graduate student, uh, Chris Stevens, needed a project. And the lab needed a more projects, so uh, decided, he decided to do it on sea uh, lion diving reflex in sea lions. And so we trained sea lions to dive on command and hold their breath in the ocean, not in a swimming pool or anything like that, because that had been done. And uh, we built this raft, which we moored there, and underneath it was netting down to 15 feet so that the sea lion could swim around and so on. And we trained on the, on the raft. I became a carpenter. I hadn't been a carpenter before. Um, we built that from scratch. Had to chuck all the materials over and everything. You can see the dinghy was in use. <laughs> we had a line strung between that and the dock. It's not a good thing to do. And that's where it sat. I walked out on the end of the dock. Where <laughs> that raft, the, the dock is further out than that raft was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, we went over to the Marine Line of the Pacific, and they taught us how, how to train sea lions, everything a graduate student should know, you know. Um, and it was, it was interesting, but first we had to catch them. Sure. Uh, there is no off-the-shelf sea lion that, you know, you don't go to Petco and say, I want, I want two sea lions, please. So we got together with the Navy. <laughs> The Navy had a uh, marine mammal program at Point Magoo and in San Diego, and they needed some sea lions, and of course, San Nicolas Island is owned by the Navy. And so we flew out there in the Navy planes and, uh, and caught sea lions um, several trips. Um, the, uh, the, the method was very simple, a large net, <laughs> and then stand back, because they were not happy. Uh, got bit many times. They do hurt. And we uh, we borrowed the chief's truck, but we neglected to tell the chief. And uh, it had a radio in it, and the whole time we were out, the radio had language on there that I can't repeat from the chief. Who in the hell is that? I mean, it's an island. You can't get off of it, but he had no vehicle. So he, on weekends, he was in charge of the whole island. Everybody else would fly to the mainland. So we, uh, we kind of had to hide uh, the whole weekend. And then training sea lions requires a lot of food. We'd go in their whalers to San Pedro fish market and get frozen boxes of mackerel and squid and sardines and load up the Boston River and come over and um, uh, that's how we train them with, with uh, the food. About that time, uh, I, had, I uh, was buddied up with this young lady on Farnsworth Bank and a year later we were married. Um, Vivian was also the guiding officer just before Ronnie, right? For a number of years. Bob Gibbon was first one, Vivian was second, and you're third? I guess so. Anyway, um, she was also on the chamber crew and a lot of other things. Um, now, <laughs> uh, in, in those days, what we did in those days, you could probably do on my thumbnail now, but this was a physiological recorder that we dove with to record heart rate, respiration, various other uh, parameters. 
And that was a big deal. It was the only one around that I knew of. And uh, so we did a lot of uh, diving with that. And my first uh, research grant was with the Jans Foundation, which probably doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but they had a vessel, the searcher, uh, that I had for 10 days. And we moored it uh, out there on where the drop off is of Bird Rock to make 210 foot dives. And uh, uh, again, with the physiological recorder, uh, triple tanks, two regulators, um, had to strap the regulator in your mouth with neoprene because it was 42 degrees down there and your lips would go numb and the regulator would fall out. Uh, so it was a lot of gear, a lot of decompression at 10 minute bottom time. Um, this is Bob Given at 210 feet. Uh, and that's Bob Given getting his EEGs done. The fellow out there is the director of the Brain Research Institute at UCLA. And, uh, and then also uh, we had Abe Cockett, who was a Harvard general who was interested in uh, blood work, so giving blood. It was a multifaceted study. It wasn't just my underwater recording. This is kind of interesting. Uh, Given came up with, uh, he said his vision was fuzzy. Oh, well, that's not good. So looked in his eyes and there just bubbles in his eyes. Went, oh my God, this is really bad. Forgot to tell us that he's wearing contacts. The <laughs> bubbles <laughs> <laughs> are all under the contact. <laughs> we thought we discovered something really good. Took a lot of pictures of it. But, uh, that's all it was. And then uh, uh, we got a uh, grant from the uh, Office of Naval Research to do uh, bubble detection. This is when bubble detection first started using Doppler, that little thing in the middle there you put on your chest and you can listen to heart sounds and, and if any bubbles go through the heart, you can hear them. And uh, did, did that work for about four years out here, a lot of dives, uh, various places. Um, and then uh, had another four years, again, from the Office of Naval Research on pulmonary function in, in diving, using some, uh, in addition to a new generation of uh, recorder, we also uh, took gas samples at various depths. And you'd be amazed how much CO2 you have at 100, if you're working at 100 feet or 130 feet, it, uh, it's, it's shocking. And uh, people have, have passed out from that. Um, but it was kind of a cumbersome thing, um, especially in a kelp bed. Um, we also developed an underwater ergometer so, so we could measure the amount of exercise we were doing underwater. Anyway, about that time, Bob and I uh, started teaching a course in uh, well, scientific diving. It was a graduate level course in the Department of Biology. I think it was five units. And it was six weeks, six days a week. And uh, it was a lot of diving. Uh, the the uh, curriculum was pretty heavy. Uh, people were in the water sometimes uh, five, six dives a day, doing all sorts of stuff. Some of the classes. Given uh, what did a lot of transect surveys and that takes a lot of time. And he was always looking for more bottom time because it's so efficient to do surface supported diving. You go down, spend a half hour and then you got to come up and you know, you can't get very much done. So one day um, he says, well, let, how can we do something longer? So Bruce Bassett was here at the time and he loved to play with uh, calculating decompression. So he, he calculated a six hour dive in ascending uh, profile. 
and Gibbon actually did this, um, and it worked fine. He was colder than hell, <laughs> but uh, halfway through, we sent down a sandwich and a, and a Coke, and he stuck his head and shoulders up in the garbage can, and he had something to eat and drink. <laughs> really a poor man's uh, way of uh, doing that. But I bring this up because it, it, it comes in a little later in the talk. The, the quest was for more and more bottom time. That was, that was the objective. And, well, lead right into it, saturation diving, um, which is basically living under pressure on the bottom. And the advantage is that you can work all day out there, uh, and then at the end of, say, a week of living down there, you can you have one decompression. It may be a long one, but but you only have one to deal with. Whereas if you're diving from the surface, every time you go up and down, you have to worry about decompression. So saturation diving during the 60s and 70s was a really big deal. Everybody was getting involved with that. There were habitats. And, the Navy was involved, um, and so on. And one of the habitats was called Hedra Lab, and it was in the Bahamas. And so it was on a shelf, it's way up in the left-hand corner there. Um, and it was supported originally by uh, Ed Link and, and a guy named Perry. But then Noah took it over, and Noah ran it. And we made two saturation dives, Bob Given, myself, and Vivian, um, each dive was seven days, and uh, you literally could work all day in the water. It was really very efficient. Uh, we did a lot of different studies. Uh, the interior was 100% humidity, <laughs> as you could tell. Uh, it was, it's in the tropics, so it was hot all the time. Um, there's a it's a, it's a uh, eight foot cylinder about 16 feet long, and then there's a trunk which is a lockout trunk that uh, uh, you, that's how you entered the water. Um, and uh, we again did a lot of physiological monitoring, and uh, that that was a telemetering EEGs with the antenna floating up above there. Uh, it's something that hadn't been done before. It worked. We used hoses, no scuba, either one. Then the inevitable needle came out. There's a PR shot for Scuba Pro. <laughs> they supported the, the dive with those suits, <laughs> which was nice. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. And, and from there on, Bob and I were convinced that we needed a habitat here. Now, this was in 1971, and it wasn't until 1980 that we uh, finally uh, got to that point. But during that whole time, we were convinced that was this was the place to have it. I still am. Okay, I'll switch over to, have any of you heard of the uh, Gomar Explorer? <laughs> The official name was Project Azorian. It was a classified name for the CIA, but the press uh, somehow found the name Project Jennifer, and there are two books written called Project Jennifer, but that really wasn't the name of the project. It was Azorian. If you're interested, PBS did a, uh, a two-hour job on that. If you haven't seen it, you should. I have it here, but it's two hours. It is probably the most sophisticated ship ever built. And it's just an amazing project. The project was to, to grab a submarine 13,000 feet down on the, the, a Russian submarine that had sunk and not let the Russians know that we were doing it. And to pick it up at 13,000 feet and bring it up. Uh, and the, and the purpose was to get the code books on the submarine. And uh, um, they, they halfway succeeded. In any event, uh, why am I bringing that up? Well, one day the Gromar Explorer pulled in. Uh, right in there. That's a big ship. And uh, the whole purpose of them being here was uh, so they were here day and night, 
was that barge there contained the claw that was to go around the submarine, pick it up. But they couldn't put it into the ship when the ship was being built. So the sole purpose of them being at the isthmus and for that whole, whole hangar was they would sink the hangar down to the bottom, open up the top, the ship would come over the top, go down, pick up the claw, bring it up into the moon pool, shut the bottom of the ship, and the hangar would come to the surface and they'd all leave. Um, the barge behind it is important. That was a diving barge. It had a chamber on board. The divers were Navy divers loaned to the CIA, so they were in civilian clothes, but they were a Navy detachment from San Diego, and they had their chamber. Um, you can see that the top of the barge, uh, those doors all slid open when it was on the bottom, and because the, this was a classified project, and the cover story was that Howard Hughes built this and was going to mine for manganese nodules on the ocean floor. Um, that was the cover story, and that was the only reason Howard Hughes was involved. He agreed to it, but it was funded by the CIA, and um, it, the cover story worked well until one day some burglars broke into the Howard Hughes office building in LA, not intending to take anything about this, they didn't know anything about this, but they grabbed a bunch of stuff, one of which was a letter that explained everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this went right to the President of the United States. They were completely, uh, they didn't know what to do. Um, anyway, ultimately the LA Times broke the story. The guys at the bar at the Isthmus, who were always going on about manganese nodules and so on, then the LA Times broke the story, and they were really, really red-faced. Um, in any event, the reason I bring this up is that um, the, I was doing, you can see the barge is half sunk out there. Mm. Well, at the time I was doing some, uh, uh, some of my research dives, and the fellow there got the bends. Um, I had no chamber. There was no chamber in LA at that time. But I knew there was a chamber on the barge. Um, so uh, we got in a skiff and went over to there and I said, hey guys, can you treat? <laughs> <laughs> and after some language that I can't repeat, um, they, uh, they said, sure. And uh, I went in with the subject with my bubble detector, and I think that was the first time I, I recorded bubbles going away during compression, which was really kind of cool. Anyway, we treated in there, and I came back and I said, that's it, I've been wanting to get a chamber for a long time for research, not for treatment, but for research. And I said, this, this gives it the second reason. And uh, so I started calling around, uh, intending to get a small 54 inch standard kind of chamber. And it went to uh, uh, Pat Meehan, who called uh, the flight surgeon at Lockheed, who said, sure, I got a chamber you can have. Um, and uh, he called me and said, hey, we've got a free chamber. Oh, wonderful, terrific, thinking, you know. This <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, overcame 24 tons of steel. And uh, they had to take it out of the basement. So uh, Bechtel Corporation and Floor Corporation did all that as a donation and trucked it down to San Pedro where they painted everything and they built a skid for the compressor. And then Pacific Tow and Salvage uh, brought it over. They donated a day of their uh, time and they put it, uh, they built these uh, uh, wheels on the, to, to fit the rails and put it on the rails and said, see ya. <laughs> and uh, so it, you got to realize we're a bunch of physiologists <laughs> <laughs> with zero heavy equipment ex expertise. But uh, it was really pretty simple. We pulled it up and then 
Bob Gibbons Oscar was sitting on that thing and it was in the way and you couldn't go in. So had to uh, pull it in caddy corner with come alongs and jacks. We didn't use anything motorized, everything was hand tools. And uh, we placed it where it sits right now. And then uh, actually it was harder to bring the uh, skid in. And the reason was that that was asphalt over there. And this thing weighed seven tons. And uh, so we had to put steel plates down and again using jacks and come alongs, uh, got it to where it sits now. Okay, about that time, or a little after that, the Institute for Marine and Coastal Studies was created, I guess, with Don Walsh and Don Keach. And the name was changed to uh, CMSC, Catalina Marine Science Center. And uh, I put this in because this is an H3 Coast Guard helicopter brought in a small one-man chamber with a patient in it. And he landed on that road. And if you look at the rotors, you can see the angle. And the rotor is practically hitting the top of the cab. And the pilot got out and walked over here and he said, I can't land here. <laughs> So that was one of the reasons why the heliport was built, because the Coast Guard was refusing to land. Because this area was all that was there, and, and especially with the bigger helicopters, they couldn't land. They were landing all over the place. They were landing up, up the canyon, on the roads, over at the isthmus. And so one of the things that the Dons, Don Walsh and Don Keach did was say, oh, we got to have a heliport. So they found the money, and as long as we're building a heliport, let's build a, a pier, because <laughs> the old one um, was pretty small. Um, so, uh, in fact, that's what's left of the old pier down there on the waterfront. So they built this thing, and well, you know, you know what it looks like now. Uh, also about that time, we had the storm of the century. I'm not kidding. It rained so hard, I, I couldn't believe it. And it wiped out the road completely. We used, we used boats to go back and forth to the instruments. We, there was no road at all. It was really incredible. Whoa. That's what the code looked like. <laughs> and, uh, oh, this is when the old pier was still there. So this is before um, <laughs> I couldn't remember. Um, in any event, um, uh, the whole hillside came down. Uh, it was like that for, for a, a week or two. Okay, next, uh, a submersible called the, the Taurus came in. A uh, company named Heiko from Vancouver uh, had this uh, submersible, it was a big submersible. And it had lockout capability, so it could rescue submariners by locking on the hatch. And so this was a test site for them, just like for the Beaver, which were, were originally they used it as a test site. And they would launch this thing every day and, and uh, take it out um, down out about a mile or so, and and uh, they they set a uh, flange down at the bottom, and they're they're practicing mating to that flange, and. Uh, what they've noticed on the flange, just is at a thousand feet out there, all these crabs running around. And they said, oh, geez, I'd really like to get some of these crabs. They had a manipulator, but it was one of these two-fingered you know, things, and they couldn't grab the crabs. So they came up and were talking about it and said, uh, what do you think? Uh, so early one morning, the students came out, and they couldn't understand why anybody would steal the basketball net off <laughs> <laughs> the lab. Well, the reason was, <laughs> put that in the claw, and we were, by an hour, we chased crabs with, with the basketball net. They got their basketball net back, but um, we caught the crab, but when we put them in the box, and they'd crawl out and run away, so. <laughs> Never, never were able to uh, bring them out. Anyway, yeah. So, as I mentioned, 
Now, all this time, Bob and I were convinced that we needed a, a, an underwater habitat here at, at the lab. And so in 1979, we put in a proposal to NOAA, and <laughs> it was funded in 1980. Um, and so we, we did a conceptual design. Uh, that's what this is. Uh, this, this artist was from Florida, so the cat bed isn't exactly uh, <laughs> the way it should be. But uh, and then we did the uh, the detailed engineering with Perry Ocean Graphics, and then uh, the contract was let to build it in Victoria, Texas, where it was built. Um, and the concept was to use the hangar to bring the habitat into the hangar, and that's where it would be stored. So it's not a, something something out in the ocean getting rusty and so on. And then launch it and pull it out to the point, and then there'd be an umbilical that would attach to it and then sink it. Uh, and then it, we, were, we were shooting for 120 feet. And what made this possible, of course, was the clear and calm conditions. Uh, and uh, uh, the concept was to to winch it down to a concrete slab and then have the umbilical attached to it. Uh, some of you may have seen this model. Uh, he told me, he told me that it was given to Bob Gibbons family. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad. Uh, funny story. Uh, the funding was from the Department of Commerce to NOAA, and Senator Larry Weicker was chairman of the Commerce Committee. And to sell the project, uh, Gibbon and I went to Washington and, and took this model with us and walked into his office very plush big office with nice rugs and everything and I'm carrying this thing and but, but one of the rugs was up a little bit <laughs> I tripped and fell over <laughs> right in front of the center hmm this is a good way to start this <laughs> really cool really cool well we put it back together anyway it was built and we named it the George Bond. George Bond is sort of the father of saturation diving, captain in the Navy. And we uh, got approval from his family to use it. He had died in the meantime. But, um, and then uh, Senator Lowell Riker decided he wanted it named the Aquarius. And it was very embarrassing to write back to the family and say, no, I had to take George's name off of it. This is the inside when it was brand new. And then about uh, five years ago, I got the chance to uh, to go dive on it, where it sits now in the uh, off uh, Key Largo, Florida, uh, with a little bit of growth on it. Uh, Noah has been using it for quite a few years. Uh, about two years ago, it lost its funding and now, now belongs to Florida International University or something like that. It's still there and it's still operable. Went inside, it was really uh, great. There was a, NOAA, a, a NASA mission, and uh, uh, because in space you have weightlessness, you have weightlessness here, and, and you, you can't go home, and you can't go home with this. So, with those two combinations, NASA was using it as an analog. In any event, uh, this is a real thrill for me because we built a thing, but I had never been on it or anything. So, the, but the growth was amazing on it. <laughs> Get their scrapers out. Um, it, uh, they do scrape around the valves <laughs> and uh, the big window. Um, it, uh, it really brought back memories. So, Noah decided, well, Noah Riker decided that it was not going to come here. That was not a program decision, that was a political decision. He had a retirement home in St. Croix, and Hyderlad was there, and he liked to make a saturation dive himself once a year. Hyderlad was uh, deemed inoperable because of the rust, the only other habitat was ours, so instead of coming here, it went to St. Croix. And that was, a, to say the least, very disappointing. 
In any event, we still had more funding and we convinced them to do something that was something halfway between saturation diving and surface diving. Uh, and we called it the way station program. So one day, uh, we drove down to the Navy down in uh, uh, San Diego, where I knew they had these bells from, from the Sea Lab 3 experiments. And uh, a friend of mine was uh, in the Navy, a commander in the Navy. I dragged him along because the surplus people, if you come in, they don't always cooperate if they don't know you. So Dave stood around the corner and I asked the guy, you know, I'd like that bell. And he said, ah, I don't know if I want to give it to you. Dave walked around and said, excuse me, I think this gentleman would like that for a race table. Yes, sir, right away. <laughs> <laughs> right back. <laughs> it was amazing. Anyway, we brought it down and when we got done with it, it looked like this. And the whole idea, this is the inside, it had air, oxygen, um, it had two flip down seats. We could sit, eat, drink, whatever. Um, and it had hot water capability. We also needed a support vessel, so I went to the Navy again. <laughs> and I got this <laughs> craft. And I forget the name of it, but it has a classification. But you know, somebody know Greg. Uh, <laughs> we took it for a spin one day. <laughs> that was a thrill. Anyway, we converted it to look like that. And it was a primary support vessel for, uh, for the operation. We also built a uh, control station for training uh, hose diving. And we did a lot of that off the dock. Uh, anybody that was going to use that uh, was going to have to, uh, you could use it with scuba, but most people used hoses. And the reason was that one of the hoses was hot water. You stick it in your wetsuit down here and you are very comfortable. And if you're going to do a six hour dive, cold is your primary problem. And so uh, anybody that used it got qualified in hose diving. And uh, we had various uh, masks. And, um, did anybody take that? Yeah. You took it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what we did, we launched this thing and then towed it out to the site. And there was a big steel clump at the bottom and you, you attach the cable to it. And then there was a worm gear inside the thing. You could just lower yourself or raise yourself in any, any depth you, that you wanted. And uh, this is what the operation yeah. looked like uh, when we were um, we did a lot of, a lot, uh, I, I, I don't even remember how many dives. There were six hour dives, and uh, with, that's a hot water unit uh, pump, and you see the umbilical going down to the waste station. And uh, uh, it was great. Uh, a bio, the biologist that worked it uh, found that if, if you went out and made surface dives for six hours, uh, in a wetsuit and came back, you're dead for the rest of the day. These guys would come back after six hours in the water and they got to the lab and they work another 12, five hours. That's how much difference the, the cold makes. And uh, they loved it. Uh, so, uh, I, I, like I said, I don't remember how many dives were made, but then the money ran out and uh, this is decompression. When we decompressed, you just get inside, put on an oxygen mask, and then run gear, that's the winch down there, uh, up to, let's say, the 20-foot stop or the 10-foot stop, and, and you eat and drink and, and uh, warm, and uh, it was great. I still think it's a very viable method. And uh, the, the work that was done was actually very extensive. <laughs> okay. And that's the end. <laughs> that was about that. Did you? I don't remember that. <laughs> Any questions? The <laughs> early days.
still think we should get a habit of Yeah. Or at least a race. Or did you show me the uh, uh, four nine? What? Yeah. Or a little starter? Yeah. They told me that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you designed a habitat for us right now, what would it look like? Would it just, look like look just like that. Yeah. yeah. And, I, I, and like I said, we designed it for 120 feet with mixed gas. And we spent $100,000 just on insulation on the, on the hull. And then they take it to the tropics. Right, yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, total waste. Uh, no, I, exactly what it was designed. We went through iteration after iteration. We had an advisory board of very well known people. We had a, a safety board. We had a medical board. Uh, tremendous number of ideas went into the design. And, uh, and we had a good time, right, Phil? <laughs> It, it's expensive. Yeah. Bottom line, it's very expensive. Even Noah now can't support it. But, uh, because, uh, you know, really, marine science is not at the top of the list for Congress. Now, when you're training students, how many students are you training? Is there a lot of interest? Very little? You mean the scientific diver training? Yeah. Well, you saw the graduating class. That's about how many we had. Was that, was that like once a year? Oh, like yeah, once a year. Oh, God. The, yeah, we do it more than once a year. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it was a killer. It was a real killer. Were they, all, were they all biology students? No, no. Yeah, about half of them were USC, about half were biology, but there were several other disciplines involved. We had students from Saudi Arabia, from Mexico, from uh, UCLA, from uh, Several other universities. There was, the, there was one in Florida, but it was different. It wasn't like this. This was the most intense. I, I mean, uh, they really went through a lot. <laughs> Some of them ended up in pretty pretty high positions in, in marine science. But it's, I'll tell you, it's a killer for the team, for the instructors. It's true. Something's a change, right? Because we will know which is the one from the river. Yeah, it's a killer. I don't know why we, I can't remember why we stopped doing it, but I could guess. <laughs> I think Bob and I were doing now. Any 